Hello everyone. So today we are going to talk about Arms and a Man by George Bernard Shaw. It is a humorous play that shows the futility of war and deals comically with the hypocrisies of human nature. So we'll be dealing with the theme, characters, plot overview and the author's motive. So first I'll be reading out what is in the slide and then I'll explain you. So Arms and the Man is a play by George Bernard Shaw. Its title comes from Virgil Aeneid in Latin. The play was first produced in 1898. It's an anti-romantic comedy and humorous play. So the play was first produced in 21st April 1894 at the Avenue Theatre and it was published in 1888 as a part of Shaw's Pleasant Play's Pleasant Volume. Okay? It also included Candida, You Never Can Tell and The Man of Destiny. So this was one of the commercial success for Shaw. He was called on to stage and uh, after the curtain he was applauded and um, out of which one audience member booed. So Shaw replied in a characteristic fashion, My dear fellow, I quite agree with you, but what are we two against so many? So this incident attracted a lot of attention to this play. So this is what is written here. So coming to the author, he is considered one of the greatest English speaking dramatists after Shakespeare. He was born on July 26, 1856 in Dublin, Ireland and he was the only son and youngest of three children of their parents. He became a music critic for a newspaper and in 1888 he took a portion of the drama critic at the Saturday Review. He owns an academic award for the best screenplay in 1938 for Pac-Malion movie. So, as you all know, Shaw was born in Dublin, but he moved to London in 1876, where he struggled to establish himself as a writer and a novelist, and embarked on a rigorous process of self-education. By the mid-1880s, he had become a respected theatre and music critic. Following a political awakening, he joined the graduate Fabian Society and became its most prominent pamphleteer. Shaw had been writing plays for years before his first public success, Arms of the Man in 1894. He was influenced by Henrik Ibsen. He sought to introduce a new realism into English language drama using his plays as vehicles to disseminate his political, social, and religious ideas. So that's what is written here. So totally there are eight characters: Captain Blumsky, Raina Petkoff, Sergei Staranov, Major Petkoff, Captain Petkoff, Nicola and Nauka. So this is the plot overview. It is now by 1885 during the server Bulgarian War. A Serbian officer enters into Raina Petkov's room by climbing the water pipe to the balcony. Raina saves the officer and the Russian officer leaves. Raina was amused that the Serbian officer keeps chocolate instead of ammunition. Raina and her mother help her to stay that night in their home. one so let me explain the act one and then you can read the keywords so the play unfolds in bulgaria in 1885 towards the end of the serber bulgarian war raina petkov and her mother Catherine have received news that raina's fiance sergius led a victorious cavalry charge against the serbian forces so as you can see the raina and her family belong to the bulgarian uh, part and the officer who will be climbing her balcony belongs to the Serbian part. So, uh, politically, practically speaking, these two are enemies. But see what happens. So, Lauka, the household maid, enters uh, to announce that the windows must be locked as fleeing Serbian troops are being hunted down the street. Later that night, a Serbian officer climbs the drain pipe outside Rainer's balcony and breaks into her room. Bulgarian soldiers arrive, asking to inspect the room and Raina, overwhelmed by a moment of compassion, hides the enemy soldier behind the curtains. Lauka is the only one who sees through the deception, but she only smirks and leans in silence. Once safe, the soldier comes out from hiding and explains he is a Swiss mercenary for the Serbian army. He admits to Raina that he does not carry cartridges for his gun, only chocolates, as these are more practical for a starving soldier. Seeing him childish, Raina offers the soldier some chocolate cream, which he devours hungrily. 
He explains that the cavalry charge led by Rhinus Keontes Sergius was only successful as a result of dumb luck. So, this so I have explained this act clearly. You can read the keywords to get an overall meaning. So I have told you that the cavalry charge led by Rhinus fiancé Sergius was only successful as a result of dumb luck. Angered, Rhina finally demands to him to leave, yet the Swiss mercenary claims to be too exhausted to move. Feeling pity, Rhina agrees to shelter him and runs to find her mother. When the two women return, the chocolate cream soldier, has, Rhina calls him, has fallen asleep in her bed. So this is what Act 1 is. So now So the second act begins with Nicola, an older servant lecturing his fiancée Lauka on appropriate conduct towards their employers. As they speak, Major Petkov, Rainer's father, returns from the front. He announces that the war has ended with a peace treaty upsetting his wife Catherine, who believes Bulgaria should have been annexed Serbia. Shortly afterwards, Rainer's fiancée Sergius arrives. The once idealistic man has grown cynical, resigning from the military and complaining about the lack of honour and bravery among the professional soldiers. He recounts an anecdote about a fleeing Swiss mercenary escaping into the bedroom of a fascinated Bulgarian woman, alarming Raina and Catherine. Once alone, Raina and Sergius speak of their love for each other in reverential and somewhat ridiculous tones. So as soon as Raina leaves to get to her hat, Sergius embraces Lauka and complains how exhausting his relationship with his fiancée is. Lauka claims not to understand the hypocrisy of the upper class, saying that both Sergius and Raina pretend to love each other by flirting with other people. Demanding to know whom Raina has been seeing, Sergius grabs Lauka and bruises her arm. Lauka asks that he kiss it, uh, kiss it an apology, but Sergius refuses just as Raina enters the garden. As soon as the couple prepares to leave for a walk, Catherine calls Sergius to the library to help Major Petkoff arrange some troop movements. Catherine and Raina discuss the significance of Sergius telling the anecdote about the escaping mercenary. Through her mother's charging, Raina expresses a desire for Sergius to learn of her part in the story, wishing to shock his fox property. As Raina exits, Lauka enters and announces that a Swiss officer is at the door. So as you can see both the fiancés are not in love with each other but they are flirting with other people. So, um, as Captain Adams, uh, Captain Blanchley, the chocolate cream soldier, has come to return the code that was used to smuggle him out of the house. As Captain attempts to send him away, Major Petkoff recognizes him from the peace negotiations, greets him warmly, and asks him to help coordinate Bulgarian troop movements. Dinah sees him in the hallway and gasps that it's the chocolate cream soldier. Thinking quickly, she explains to her father and fiancé that she made a chocolate cream decoration in the shape of a soldier, but Nicola had clumsily crushed it. So, this is what Act 2 was. Now let us come to Act 3. Later that afternoon, Captain Blanchley makes short work of the administrative task. Major Petkoff wonders about the fate of his old lost coat. At Catherine's request, Nicola fetches the coat that had previously disappeared, astounding the Major. The Major, Sergius and Catherine leave to implement Blanchely orders, leaving the Captain alone with Raina. 
Regina begins uh, posturing, uh, complaining how morally wounded she is by having to lie for him. The captain sees through her act and confronts her. He is the first person to see her presumptuous behavior for what it is. Regina admits to behave uh, in theatrically and suspects Blanchely must despise her. On the contrary, Blanchely is charmed by her posturing but cannot take it seriously. Suddenly, Blanchely receives a telegram informing him of his father's death and his large inheritance. So there are no keywords for this act. You can understand from the scene displayed here. Raina and Blanchely exist as Lauka and then Sergius enter. Sergius inspects uh, Lauka's arm and offers to kiss her bruise but is rejected. Lauka questions his notations of uh, bravery, uh, arguing that anyone may be brave in a battle but few are able to stand up to social expectations. She asks Sergius if he would marry someone below his station for love. Sergius claims that he would but uses his engagement to Raina as an excuse. Hurt, Lauka teases him with the knowledge that Blanchely is Raina's true love. You can see from these scenes, like how he tries to kiss the blue. So finally what happens is that, Sergius challenges Blanchely to a duel. Raina enters and argues with Sergius announcing that she saw him embracing Lauka. Blanchely explains to Sergius that Raina only let him remain in her room at gunpoint. Somewhat deflated, Sergius withdraws from the duel. When Blanchely suggests that Lauka join the conversation, Sergius leaves to look for her, only to find her eavesdropping in the hallway. Having understood that something is awry, Major Petkoff enters and demands to know who is the shock extreme soldier. Blanchely admits that it is he. Raina explains that she is no longer engaged to Sergius as he loves Lauka. Sergius kisses Lauka's hand, committing himself to marry her. Lauka's original fiancé, Nicola, gracefully bows out. Blanchely follows Sergius' lead and asks for Raina's hand. The captain's new inheritance, a successful chain of hotels, first with Major Petkoff to agree to the marriage. Blanchely leaves to take care of his father's estate with promises to return the fortnight. So this is what the conclusion is. So the play is interesting and entertaining, yes. So it gives us a lesson not to glorify the war, not to create class discrimination. So the condition of today's world is still very similar to the scenario of the play, isn't it? So this is the author's motive. You can clearly see how he wants the society to be. It should not be divided in classes. Neither uh, one should, uh, what to say, one should not uh, cheat on his wife or fiancé or anyone. So in the play, the writer has succeeded in making his point quite clear. He satirizes the romantic notions about love, marriage and war. The writer criticizes the attitude of rich people who glorify themselves. He reveals his attitude about the class discrimination. This is what I have told you. So this is the theme of the play. You can say romance, war, love class discrimination, idealism versus realism and you can use synonyms for these words. So hope you have understood the play. So thank you everyone. Goodbye.